you might as well get going since uh, it looks so quiet. Uh, with that being said, welcome to Coffee and Conversations. Uh, Coffee and Conversations is a collaboration between uh, the Bureau of Education and Training, uh, New Hampshire Association of Certified Public Managers, and UNH. So and I want to thank UNH for hosting. You do a great job. Um, so as far as this morning, um, it's interesting. Last month I was watching the um, New Hampshire Business on WMUR. I'm looking and I'm looking closely. I'm like, I think I know that speaker. And uh, sure as heck, it was uh, it was Kirsten, uh, who was in our who was in, it was in our CPS program, and she did a great job. So the next morning, I emailed her and said, Would you mind speaking at a coffee and conversations on your expertise? And uh, she's so nice and professional. Of course I would. And so that was her first response. And so uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Kirsten today. So my pleasure to introduce her. Uh, Kirsten Kirsten Howard is the Coastal Resilience Coordinator for the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program. Kirsten completed her Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and Economics at Brown University and her Master of Science degree in Environmental Policy and Planning at the University of Michigan School of Natural Resources and Environment. After graduate school, she kicked off her career in climate change adaptation with a road trip around the country to uncover and share stories of people building resilience to climate impacts in their communities. She lives in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and it is my pleasure to introduce Kirsten Howard. So, All right, thanks for joining me this morning and having me, I really appreciate it. And um, I, and thanks for the introduction, Frank. Um, I am going to start this off with um, a little bit of context for you all before we get into the New Hampshire specific stuff um, and uh, kind of what needs to be done about um, uh, sea level rise in New Hampshire. That was my last slide that just popped up, so hopefully. Um, 
I took the chief of resilience from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration out for a walking tour in the town of Hampton, down at Hampton Beach, uh, a few weeks ago. So um, I took him out and we, we walked down one of the streets um, that is a little bit south of the police and fire station um, to the west of Ashworth Ave. Um, and we met up with Steve and Bonnie. Steve and Bonnie live in this neighborhood. They own property there. Um, Bonnie is one of those beach residents who has um, been going to Hampton Beach forever. She worked in restaurants when she was a teenager there. Now she's retired, she brings her grandkids. Um, and her family owns a property that's been in her family for a little while, a little beach hut um, or shack that um, they use sometimes and then also rent out for some income. Steve, on the other hand, uh, moved to the beach fairly recently. <coughs> when he retired, he put his retirement savings into four properties in this neighborhood um, to generate the income that he depends on in his retirement that his family depends on. Um, so Steve and Bonnie met up with us and um, I, there's one, they have all sorts of really interesting stories about the risks that they're facing and the, the flooding that they've been seeing not just in big storms, but also when there's a full moon um, at, at Hampton Beach. Um, and I could talk a lot about that, but there's one anecdote in particular that really stuck with me. So Steve shows up to this, this meeting and he's got a photo album in his hand. And this photo album has um, kind of like a rainbow pattern on it. So it's a photo album that is really supposed to probably hold photos of your uh, family reunions and your uh, your weddings and uh, your birthday parties. Um, Steve's rainbow colored photo album holds photos of the flood damage and the, the, the flood events that he has witnessed over the last several years living in this neighborhood. And so as he and the chief of resilience at NOAA flipped through this photo album, he turned to the chief of resilience and said, you know, the first time the high tide flooding happened, it was cool and exciting, and we took photos, and it was just kind of a wonder to behold. The 50th time, not so much. And um, you can tell that this stress of uh, flood damage is weighing on Steve to the point where he said to the chief of resilience, um, I would like to sell my properties. I've put them on the market, and I've concluded that they're not sellable. So I tell you that example because this isn't Steve's property specifically, and both Bonnie and Steve did give me permission to share their stories today. Um, but I tell you that example because they're on the front lines of, what, of something that we are going to be seeing a lot more, um, not just in New Hampshire's low-lying coastal communities, but nationally and globally, all happening at the same time. Um, and so the scale of this problem um, can be a little daunting. And I think looking to Steve and Bonnie's experiences and challenges as they're, they're sort of dealing with it first um, is something that is really helpful when thinking about policy. <laughs> All right. Um, so I wanted to summarize for you a little bit of the science that we have gathered in New Hampshire related to coastal flood risks um, and the projections associated with that. The uh, New Hampshire legislature actually requires the Department of Environmental Services to work with agencies and uh, experts to summarize the science every five years so that we're using the best info that we have. Uh, they published their latest update through the University of New Hampshire in August and it presents uh, flood risk information about sea level rise, coastal storms, groundwater rise associated with sea level rise, and uh, changes in precipitation that are expected in coastal New Hampshire. So giving you a little bit of a, a teaser of what's in there, and it is, it is publicly available so you can access it. Um, giving you a little teaser of what's in this report, uh, for sea level rise, the information, the projections vary depending on what our future looks like. So if you make a very basic assumption that globally greenhouse gas emission um, 
greenhouse gas concentrations are going to stabilize by the end of the century, and our emissions are going to start actually going down by around 2040 globally, then we are likely to see sea level rise with, uh, between 0.7 and 1.3 feet by 2050 in the next 30 or so years. And actually the projections for 2050 are pretty similar across most of the greenhouse gas emission scenarios uh, because those next 30 years are kind of baked in already. Um, so that's one, one key takeaway to remember. When you get out to 2100 or 2150, the numbers start to diverge a little more. So keeping that assumption in mind that greenhouse gas concentrations stabilize by 2100, we will see, we are likely to see up to 2.9 feet of sea level rise. Now that's likely. There's a lesser chance, but still a chance of seeing up to 6.2 feet of sea level rise by 2100. And also a, an outside chance of seeing up to 12 feet or 11.7 feet of sea level rise by 2150. Now, if you assume that greenhouse gas concentrations do not stabilize by the end of the century, these numbers are bigger. Um, and I won't go into them today, but you can read them in the report. And now I, I feature on the right side of the screen what four feet of sea level rise looks like at Hampton Beach. And the dark blue is where high tide reaches roughly today. The lighter blues are where high tide would be in that particular future. So that would happen roughly twice a day, every day, with that amount of sea level rise. Okay. down arrow. Okay, so um, coastal storms, groundwater rise, and precipitation. I'm just going to give you a couple of, of findings from these, um, these coastal flood risks. The number of hurricanes are likely to go up, but um, it's sort of more likely than not. Uh, the, the science there is still, is still being figured out, is, is somewhat uncertain. Same with nor'easters. We're not too sure how they're going to change. The one thing we do know about storm damage is that storm, these nor'easters we see today are going to be happening on higher sea levels, which means that the waves will be bigger and uh, damage will probably be greater, um, regardless of how storms change in the future. Um, groundwater rise is kind of a new, uh, a new coastal flood risk area of, of scientific discovery. Um, as sea, le sea levels uh, to help to determine what our ground water levels are today, where that table lies today. Um, and the closer you are to the coast, the closer that groundwater table is to the surface. Um, the further you get from the coast, um, it can still be influenced by sea levels. Groundwater tables are still influenced by sea levels up to three miles from the coast. So the impact associated with a change in sea level um, on groundwater tables actually extends pretty far inland. And uh, some mapping has been done around this, but roughly the thing to remember is that as sea level rises, we'll see some sort of rise in groundwater tables. And in some places where the groundwater table is already quite high, we might see emergent, new emergent freshwater wetlands. We may see uh, septic systems being inundated other underground resources and assets uh, potentially at risk. So that's the rough concept there. The final thing um, I'll talk about is precipitation. Now this science actually really applies statewide and New England wide. Um, we are expecting to see more rain falling in storms that occur more frequently. And uh, there are the statistics around changes in precipitation are like um, Major League Baseball statistics. There are so many of them uh, that you can you can um, turn them all sorts of ways. But one that's interesting is that by the end of the century, the amount of precipitation falling on the wettest day of the year is projected to increase by eight to fifteen percent under that scenario that I talked about earlier, where greenhouse gas concentrations stabilize by the end of the century. All right, so that's your science teaser um, for the day. Um, has anyone been to Hampton Beach during a high tide flood event or a storm? So you've uh, 
How, has anyone seen photos other than this one of, of that occurring? So um, you'll see a lot more photos today. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty fascinating phenomenon to behold on a sunny day um, or maybe a slightly rainy day that the tide levels look like this and you can see a police car driving down, um, I think it's Ashworth Ave um, or up Ashworth Ave um, on the street there trailing a little bit of a wake behind it. Um, now we, we held a photo contest. This is the winner for the most vulnerable photo. Um, I wanna kinda take a second to do an exercise where given the risks that I just presented to you, we think about what our coast is going to look like if we continue with the tools that we have available right now to deal with this issue. So by that I mostly mean grants. Most of the work going on in coastal New Hampshire to try and adapt to sea level rise is one-off grant funded projects that, um, that uh, are kind of pilot projects or um, examples of how you might deal with this issue in one particular area. Um, so I'm thinking about what this future kind of looks like if we continue on this path without major systemic change. I think our beach days uh, look a little bit more like this, maybe a little harder to get to the beach. I think we'll see some of this um, building higher, but there's a salt marsh right next to this house, so building higher maybe not in the right places. We'll see more of this where municipal assets and resources are um, put in harm's way to protect people. <coughs> We'll probably see some economic opportunity for particular businesses, maybe like this one and that one and that one. <laughs> we'll probably see this. And eventually I do think we will see this where people like Steve are left with no option to have their property bought out and they give up and leave. So I'm looking at this community in Hampton Beach and I'm thinking about how do we change that course? How do we mitigate that pain that is that we're some we're on track to probably feel? Now I'll get a little positive for, for a bit. <laughs> um, so it's part two, I, I mentioned the science report that was published in August. Part two of that report is going to be a set of guidance that takes the science and helps decision makers across all venues at all scales in New Hampshire think about how to use it. How do you integrate this science into the way we do business now and how do you create new systems that um, are the right ones to deal with this, this future risk. So the guidance was out for public review this past fall. It's closed for review now, but it is still accessible in draft form online and should be published in the spring. Um, the guidance pulls the science that I summarized for you and puts forward guiding principles for how we should approach this problem. It puts forward a step-by-step -step process seven steps for how to integrate this information into a variety of decisions. And uh, it has a couple tools associated with it and case studies that are intended to help people think about this problem, about how to deal with it. So now I'm gonna do the visioning exercise where we think about what does resilience look like on our coast. And if we implement guidance like this uh, at the appropriate scale, to deal with this particular problem, what do we see um, out in these neighborhoods um, and in our communities that we care about? Um, this was the photo that won most resilient from the King Tide photo contest. It's beach grass um, holding the sand in place during a, a fairly powerful high tide. So it probably looks something like this. This is a restoration project in, in Durham, New Hampshire, planting salt marsh grass. Uh, which provides flood protection, erosion control. I mentioned that we were making pretty big assumptions about the fact that our greenhouse gas emissions 
uh, go down starting in 2040 globally. So it probably looks something like this. It probably does look like going up in places where that makes sense. It probably looks like protecting the buffer space where building may not make sense. This is Seabrook. This is a good example of a, a neighborhood, beachfront neighborhood in Seabrook and, and Salisbury next to it, south of it, that have done a pretty good job of that. It probably looks like this, where the pride in our communities, uh, the cultural and the historical resources are protected and are, um, are uh, preserved or remembered in some way where they can't be. And it also probably looks like this. This is a, an old hotel in New Jersey after Sandy hit there. Um, it was flooded and, and uh, infested with mold and not inhabitable. Um, and as a result, they accessed a FEMA grant and uh, it was bought out to restore a floodplain. This is not the actual floodplain that it was restored to, but you get the idea. So it probably looks like that. It also looks like this, which I think is a piece that isn't talked about enough, where towns like Hampton think about the safe places and think about how to invest and encourage business and uh, public institutions to be built and to be protected in those safe areas. These are just a couple of examples that I've frequented in Hampton that I think fit that, that mold. So I'm gonna run through the seven steps that the guidance presents to you um, just very quickly, just to give you an idea of what an exercise would look like if you were going to try and apply this to a decision that you're making um, in a decision-making body, about your house, whatever that might look like. Um, so the first step is really to define the project. Um, and there's a whole, that's actually probably the hardest step uh, because it means thinking about your location, how access to that location or area of interest uh, matters, what that site depends on in terms of, you know, electricity and uh, natural gas and other resources that need to access it. But it also involves thinking about the useful life, the time frame that that particular asset, um, it could be a house, it could be a whole community and a master planning process, um, is going to exist in the form that you're thinking about it. Um, then you think about how um, how tolerant is this particular area of interest, I'll call it a project, um, to flood risk. And that, it, there are a variety of factors associated with that, like what is the replacement cost or the general value of that particular project? What, um, is it sensitive to flooding? If it were flooded, would it be fine? Or if it were flooded, would it be destroyed? Does it have implications for public health and safety? Those types of things. Um, then, uh, once you've determined that tolerance for flood risk, we actually lay out a pretty clear way to choose your sea level rise number, your scenario that you might be thinking about for that particular project. And then based on that, you think about how do you plan for a storm with this sea level rise level? Um, how do you uh, think about groundwater rise at that particular project area or site? Um, how would you factor in extreme changes in precipitation and then how do you cumulatively assess all of that to make some decisions about what that project should look like. Another piece within the guidance that I um, am pretty um, happy with is the framework that we lay out for action. So when you're thinking about what is the next step to take at this project site, the guidance lays out, the guidance really clarifies that you should be really clearly evaluating all the options that you have. Everything from not spending one more penny on that particular project, taking absolutely no action there. Um, that's a decision that needs to be part of the alternatives analysis. Um, to avoiding building in a place, to accommodating water, building up and living with the water there. To resisting, that's your traditional kind of build a seawall, keep the water out approach to relocating, moving away from the water. 
So um, laying out that framework, I think, really helps people and forces people to take the responsibility for thinking about the fact that they are evaluating all of these options when they're thinking about what action to take. I'm just going to talk very briefly about a few of the projects that have actually happened in coastal New Hampshire, some of these pilot projects. I mentioned many of them are funded with grant funds. Much of that grant funding comes from federal agencies. I would say the majority of it comes from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which funds my program. Um, New Hampshire puts very little state funding into this particular issue, really if any at all, um, to be honest. Uh, local communities have leveraged quite a bit of match in the form of resources, either cash or volunteer time, for, um, absolutely. So that um, is, is commendable for sure. Um, one of the programs that I run is a, is a coastal resilience grant program where we, we pass through small grants to communities and to other actors on the coast uh, to do resilience work. And uh, we've been passing through money since 2014. We've given about $700,000 in grants to folks uh, in that time, funding 16 projects um, and leveraging $400,000 in local match. Um, some of the projects we've done include paying for master plan chapters focused, focused on coastal hazards and risks. So in Dover, for example, we did that. Um, some of the projects involve uh, paying for a regional planning commission to rewrite your flood <coughs> ordinance. Some of them have been uh, designing and running the process to get the money to build a living shoreline erosion control project at Wagon Hill Farm in Durham, which just com was completed this past year. Um, and I look, at, I look at these projects and I think they're fantastic. I think they're really good examples of, of work that needs to happen. But I also look at these projects and I think we are so far from the actual scale we need to be working at that we are not gonna make it to that vision of resilience if we continue operating in this particular way. And one indicator of that, I think, is that um, zero of the grant applications that we have received and funded have actually been written by paid municipal staff. Meaning that we aren't providing enough money to incentivize them to uh, engage fully in this topic we aren't providing enough incentive for town staff to be uh, have their work plan really focus enough time to actually access the grants that are out there on this topic. Um, we have fantastic partners that work with the communities on the concepts and that you know work with the select boards to actually approve the money. Um, but uh, this, these projects would not be happening without that additional technical support. And to me, that's an indicator that um, we're definitely falling short because um, those, I mentioned that article earlier on, the communities that are accessing the million dollar grants at the FEMA level to buy out really vulnerable properties or do other big flood protection projects have staff. They have staff, they have people who have the two weeks of time that it takes or the month of time that it takes to do the cost benefit analysis that's required to actually access that, that money and they have match. They have cash waiting to provide the 25% match that's required on these big FEMA grants so that they can actually get them and do the work on the ground with them. So um, while I think the boutique pilot projects that we've been doing are so important to show what work is needed, I just, I do wanna recognize that realistically, we are not close to actually reaching that vision. Um, which means we need to think pretty hard about, um, about how to get there. Okay. So that's kind of the point I just made. But, but um, just to say it again, we are facing this massive scale mismatch, and we're also facing concerning barriers to be able to access resilience building strategies that exist out there today. Um, and I want to bring back the point that what that's doing is, is creating and exacerbating the inequities that exist out there um, in our coast. 
in the grand scheme, there are certainly socially vulnerable populations in, in New Hampshire's coastal communities. When you, when you zoom out again and you think about how this is playing out globally and on a national level, there are places that are, are worse off than our coastal communities um, and have less access to resources than we do, and this is worse for them. Um, so um, we are one example of how that may be playing out for small communities that, um, that don't have the, the access to resources of a Boston, for example, but um, that particular perspective is really important when it comes to sea level rise because it's not all about Hampton. And, um, and I think uh, sort of an interesting conversation piece is that as communities globally are dealing with sea level rise, it is going to be harder to access those FEMA grants, that limited capital that's available that everyone is going to be competing for at the federal level. So resilience is very much about mobilizing your resources locally um, and on a state level um, so that uh, you can uh, deal with the shock of maybe not being able to access that federal money that you need in the future. So the tools that we're using, I talked mostly about grants um, that may be creating slow policy change. Um, the tools that we're, we're using definitely need a transformation. I'd love to have a conversation about that. Um, and they need a transformation that tries to at least mitigate some of the, um, that issue where uh, vulnerabilities are being exacerbated. That tries to center the needs of our socially vulnerable populations, of our smaller communities with limited staff, and that sort of um, that sort of factor. So what those look like, I mean, that's a challenge that many public policy issues are dealing with trying to solve. Um, I certainly recognize that, and it's a really hard nut to crack, but it's definitely a conversation worth having. All right, so now I actually am at this slide. Um, this was one of my personal favorite um, pink tide photos from the pink tide photo contest, because this is a woman coming home, presumably from her job, um, to find that she has to take off her shoes uh, in order to take her next steps to get home uh, in the middle of the day in Hampton. And so um, I relate <laughs> and uh, would love to have a little conversation for the next half hour or so about, about this and about some of the questions and topics I brought up. So thanks. And 
you know, that's small beans probably in the grand scheme of the type of public health issues uh, and risks that exist longer term. But um, I think uh, that partnership, I'd love to see that partnership happen. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure what the CDC has done um, locally or, or regionally to, to start to think about that. Um, we are trying to break the biggest nut that we're trying to crack when it comes to developing new partnerships that are somewhat cross-disciplinary um, is actually just creating a partnership with, with FEMA, um, which with Homeland Security and Emergency Management, which is the state agency that administers the FEMA funds, and we've been making good headway on that, but even just accessing that money, which is for flooding, is, um, is a big challenge. And so that's one. The other one that I see potential for is um, the Department of Housing um, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development has um, uh, grants for community development. Those have been accessed by other communities in other states to do buy, big buyout projects, for example, in, in communities, neighborhoods that are unsafe to live in, um, either after a storm that are health hazards or um, you know, chronically flooded. Um, and so I, I do think there's some potential that's been easier to access that um, particular set of resources. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm interested in, in folks' reaction to the fact that I think we have a very large societal challenge. Because I, and I say that because I believe leadership at many levels is required to really communicate the reality of this. So for example, in the first uh, Democratic presidential debate that was in Miami, Chuck Todd asked Governor Inslee, who was then in the race, will your plan save Miami? Will your climate plan save Miami? And I said to the television, no. It will not. I think that people do not have an appreciation of what's really coming and what, what that requires and you know the shock that's going to happen if leadership is not exercised and uh, the kind of the communication that's needed is, is carried out. And it has, as you say, it has a lot of different aspects, public health, disease, um, all sorts of impacts. So I'm interested in, in your reaction about, about the need for that kind of leadership. Yeah, does anyone else have thoughts on that particular <laughs> question? <laughs> <laughs> so. Conversation. Speak specifically to that question, though, not a new question. Is, is that okay? Okay, I'll, <laughs> the thing I'll say to that is that, believe it or not, some of the people who may be affected by climate change have a lot of clout. Like if I owned a resort in Mar a Largo, for instance, to <laughs> rise up and wipe it out, I would probably get the government to pass all sorts of uh, expensive programs to buy it out at full retail value or whatever. And in a way, that's what I see as the problem in New Hampshire. You're talking about socially vulnerable groups. I don't think there's an awful lot of poor people that have ocean for homes in New Hampshire. I think that uh, you could relocate all of them relatively nominally. That the real problem is a lot of wealthy folks that have places that have a lot of clout and are going to want some top dollar. Yeah. One thing that I found really interesting in doing work in New Hampshire, one of the programs we actually started this past year is to, it's called a Coastal Landowner Technical Assistance Program. We're working with the University of New Hampshire Sea Grant and Cooperative Extension. We modeled it after Cooperative Extension's forest reef, forest management program where they go and um, provide assistance to private timber landowners. Um, so we've gone to people's houses and sat in their living rooms um, on their request and taken site tours around their homes to take a look at foundation damage and other, other factors that they're concerned about related to coastal flooding, sea level rise. Um, sometimes it's erosion. They're worried they're losing their, their land at the shoreline. Um, I've been, I've been surprised a little bit and had to check my uh, assumptions by the fact that those homeowners that we've been seeing are not, they're not in the top 1% necessarily. Um, there certainly are people, homes like that on, in New Hampshire's coast. Um, and those people uh, often, if you're right on the beach actually, I showed the photo of, of the Seabrook Dunes, 
those homes are actually a little bit more resilient to flooding, flooding that I'm talking about, um, than some of the lower income property owners who, um, you know, maybe it is a second beach home, but they, they either inherited it and uh, it is fairly small and doesn't have insulation, or um, they might live in it full time or depend on it for rental income, but um, it's less of that super wealthy class that, that I might have thought about if I hadn't been down walking the streets and sitting in people's living rooms. It's a solid kind of middle class type of, type of demographic, especially around the back marsh areas of Hampton that are flooding much more at high tide. I've walked those neighborhoods many times, mm -hmm. and they are not wealthy people. You have people in there working two, three jobs. There's no yeah. question about that. So. But, um, but on the leadership question, unless you want to speak to that specifically. No, well, was, no, a question maybe for you though. All right, I'll, I'll come back to you in just a second just to respond to the leadership question. Um, I think you're absolutely right. If I, you know, I made a personal kind of professional goal to be more honest in the way that I present this information to people. It's informed by experience, it's informed by research. Um, but I think that that is needed in order to fully understand the scope and scale of this problem. It uh, makes for more alarming presentations, unfortunately, which is, uh, maybe doesn't make everyone feel great when they leave coffee and conversation <laughs> on a hump day, but, um, but um, I do think that's lacking uh, at multiple levels. Oh well, um, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, uh, uh, there are folks who, argued for retreat and figuring out how do we do some sort of orderly retreat at some point, and there's been a lot of criticism leveled at them. Um, but, you know, something yeah. we're gonna have to grapple with. Yeah, and it takes a little bit of courage to, to mention that as a real potential strategy for managing this, but when you look at the risks, um, it has to be part of the package, probably. All right. Christian, uh, the vast majority of, of New Hampshire state level organizations, their focus is all the communities in the whole state. Mm -hmm. Your office is, you got to focus on what, four or five communities? 17. 17, okay. Yeah. Um, how is your office received by those people who are in charge of planning and zoning and infrastructure management? Are, are you welcomed in their midst? Uh, are they in the communities yeah. that I work in? Yeah, yeah I would think so. Okay. Um, it helps that we bring money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, we we work on a variety of topics, not just coastal flood risk, including habitat restoration. We help with dam removals that have to happen, you know, because of deficiencies. Um, we provide services to communities, I would say very similarly to a, to a regional planning commission. Um, however, we can, we can bring, we regularly bring grant resources to assist them. Um, I think some of these topics are, uh, there are certainly folks within the communities we work in who don't wanna talk about some of these topics. Um, but we've done a pretty good job of creating champions and partnering with champions in the communities who are willing to lead on The other challenges for vulnerable uh, property owners and renters, and yeah. they may not be able to afford or understand the importance of flood insurance. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious as to whether in your technical systems or when meeting with people you are promoting, getting them to start thinking about that because every dollar, uninsured dollar, potentially gets transferred over into public recovery funds, yeah. which we all pay for. Yeah, so I think the statistic that's kind of mind blowing is that we for every dollar you don't spend in prevention, globally on disaster relief, you spend six dollars <coughs> in recovery. Um, we, so in the landowner program that we offer, if someone is in the floodplain or close to the floodplain, we always recommend that they get flood insurance. Um, that doesn't mean, I would say, at least half of the folks we've visited don't have it, even if they live full time in their property because they don't have a mortgage and they're not required to have flood insurance. Um, so just that not just the renters, but the folks who own the property and live in the property aren't aren't insuring their assets um, because they've found that to be too expensive for them to swallow. Um, uh, the 
issue of renters in these communities is, is a big one that is a, is a little harder to access. We definitely aren't hitting that demographic in our landowner program. Um, but I've heard a couple of instances that um, we're doing some work to try and access that community a little bit more. And there are a couple, there's one anecdote in particular that stands out to me that highlights your point really well that Bonnie actually shared with us when we were um, walking around her neighborhood. She rents her property in the summer to, to uh, and, and in the winter to, to rental, um, uh, to folks renting uh, at the beach, either for vacation or in the winter season, in the off season. And she had one tenant this past summer who um, used a walker to get around. Uh, now, one of the things Hampton has done is that her, Bonnie's neighborhood actually mobilized to get the town to allow residents in these low prone neighborhoods to park in public parking that is safer, a little higher up, during a tide that is 10 feet or higher. Hampton is projected to see something like at least 60 10 foot plus tides uh, within the year, not including weather. So it's a pretty common occurrence for some of these residents. Um, her tenant, who is in the walker, went out to dinner with her family one evening, and Bonnie wasn't around to, um, to sort of assist with parking and those types of, of um, access issues. Um, and when they came back from dinner, there was a high tide flood event occurring. So they took this woman's shoes off and made her sit on the front of the walker and pushed her down the flooded street to get back to the home where she was staying at. And I mean, that's just one example of many where, you know, this, this woman's clearly dealing with the same thing, but when you're dealing with a rental audience that doesn't necessarily fully, I mean, no one fully understands the risk really, but definitely is at a disadvantage in terms of um, uh, maybe just being there for six months in the winter. Um, they're definitely a, a vulnerable population when it comes to public safety. Yeah. Related to that, what happens to the whole transfer transportation structure and the cars that belong to those elevated houses? Where that, that where is, do they go? That is a fantastic question, and it's the biggest issue with with using a strategy of exclusively raising homes in flood prone neighborhoods. Um, these property owners on Bonnie and Steve streets are uh, bringing that up constantly. It's a chicken and an egg issue for them to even decide to raise their home because if they're going to put that investment in themselves, is the town going to raise the road so that they're able to um, park their car at a higher elevation? Um, and the town is not, has not done planning to be able to answer that question just yet. So um, I think typically um, folks park elsewhere and don't access their properties. Um, historically, the reason we've raised homes like that one on stilts is is to deal with storm events, which happen, you know, once every 30 years or once every 10 years, depending on how big the flood is associated with that storm event. Raising a home is not necessarily a long-term solution to sea level rise that's occurring, you know, every day on your property. Um, so, do you have a follow-up? For over 100 years, geographers have been trying to tell people that the floodplain belongs to the river. Yeah. Is there any hope of, of uh, transferring that concept to the coast, the floodplain, the coastal plain belongs to the ocean? Yeah, so um, some. Uh, that's the, con the concept that gets talked about or that is being talked about in the news these days is called managed retreat or managed relocation which is basically the idea that in the most low-lying, most vulnerable properties um, in the coastal floodplains, maybe the best long-term solution is to uh, potentially compensate the landowners at a, at a you know, somewhat fair market price for, for their homes, um, demolish them, and restore that area to floodplain. FEMA has programs that do that, but I think FEMA spends like $1 for every one one dollar to relocate super vulnerable properties for every one hundred dollars it spends to protect them so it's not its priority mission but th that conversation is shifting 
Um, there are a couple researchers who are doing a lot of work on it, and whether the government programs uh, get created to um, actually deal with that as a, as a management strategy on scale, I think remains to be seen. Yes? Last summer, last year, DOT did some cultural work on the one of the plants mm -hmm. the the marsh area. Yep. It didn't raise a roadway, but I'm sure this project was planned years ago. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Is DOT looking at those kinds of things in terms of where the vulnerable major arsons are that need to be elevated or Yes. Modified? DOT, actually there is a there is a law that was passed in New Hampshire that requires all state agencies to consider the best sea level rise information we have published every five years in these reports. Um, DOT has a standard operating procedure that projects now have to plan for sea level rise. They're still figuring out how exactly to incorporate that into their designs, but like you said, they're operating on like a 10 year plan and the designs have been created a long time ago, so they're, they're definitely still catching up. One interesting example that DOT, that is related to your question, that DOT has been grappling with is they are replacing the Hampton Seabrook Bridge, um, and they're in the design phase for that. They were picking a sea level rise scenario to ensure that one of the one of the important factors associated with that bridge is that it um, can allow enough clearance for fishermen to access the harbor. Um, and in order to plan for enough clearance, they have to factor in sea level rise. Um, they were they picked a four foot sea level rise scenario in a preliminary way, um, but they got a public comment from a federal agency asking them to think about ten feet. Of now, when they looked at 10 feet of sea level rise, they looked at the maps of what Hampton looks like with 10 feet of sea level rise. And they said, we are not confident that the access to the harbor will be necessary with 10 feet of sea level rise. <laughs> so those types of uh, conversations are starting to happen, but are really complicated because, you know, um, Hampton should be at the table for that. And um, I'm hoping that as we have conversations like that, um, DOT will create incentives for Hampton to plan a little more proactively and vice versa, um, because the roads, the local roads and the state roads intersect everywhere. And in order to really accomplish this in an integrated way, they have to have a plan that matches. Um, we are doing a Seacoast Transportation Corridor Vulnerability Assessment with DOT and with the Rocking and Planning Commission starting this year that will involve representatives from, I think, nine of the coastal communities. Um, so that may be a start to that conversation in a more formal way. Um, yeah, we have your hand up for a while. Um, my question is about private dollars. Um, you know, like, capitalism got us into this mess, but also the benefit of capitalism is that, like, when the, um, like, incentives are right, private money is is very large and can respond very quickly. So how could we change the legal or financial structure to incentivize private dollars uh, assisting in adaptation? Yeah, I think that that's going to be a necessary piece of the puzzle, um, especially because one of the big deficits we face is, I mentioned, that lack of match for grants. And match on grants usually has to be a local source. It can't be a federal source of funding. Um, so private dollars would be a really nice way to be able to leverage existing resources in the community that can be mobilized somewhat quickly with a willing, you know, private entity to access bigger dollars at the federal level. Um, I've seen, I've seen businesses that are interested in the conversation in the coast, but I think the, uh, the technical assistance to figure out how to engage them properly doesn't exist right now. So that's a really, um, it's a gap, and I, I'm interested to hear if you have ideas about how to fill it. Um, well, I think if there were legislation, either federal or state, that would put some requirements um, on them, which would change their calculus, mm -hmm. um, that could, you know, change the system in which they're making their decisions mm -hmm. um, sufficiently where they would start funding some of these projects. Like I'm thinking, for example, of insurance companies which have a huge stake in this. Yep. 
Yeah, that's a, and it's a good way to think about it. One program that exists now that potentially could be replicated in some way is the Aquatic Resource Mitigation Fund at the state level, which is where developers, if they're having an impact on wetlands that they can't minimize to the full extent uh, on site, they can pay into a fund that DES administers and then uses to fund conservation projects and restoration projects around the state. Um, so you, uh, it's, it's operated under the, under the EPA Clean Water Act, and um, I think there could be some sort of similar type of structure that exists from a flood risk perspective. Um, another issue just on a basic level we're seeing with development is um, that when a, a property gets maybe um, uh, developed for the first time or uh, restored or um, uh, for example, Little Jack's is a, is a restaurant in Hampton that's currently being turned into condo development. Um, in projects like that, um, if the developer is not adequately required to deal with future flood risk, they, those, those properties could be rebuilt in a way that pushes the flood water onto the neighboring properties, um, which is clearly not something that we want to, to be happening. Um, if flood risk was adequately incorporated into designs for those types of redevelopments, um, it would change the calculation for the developer. And I think maybe for a little while they would figure out creative ways to redevelop those properties. But there might be some situation in the future where the risk is so great that they just say, no, I can't, we can't do it here, we'll find another site. And then that brings up all sorts of questions about what do you do with Little Jacks um, when it's not able to be redeveloped, but the wetlands rules at the DES level are um, uh, are being changed December 15th, and that's really the first comprehensive statewide um, regulation that is going to require property owners to look at sea level rise, and I believe address it is the term that is used in the, in the regulatory language um, in new projects that need wetlands permits. So, um, it's not really getting at like the philanthropic question or the question of public-private partnership to, to deal proactively, but when it comes to development in our coast, I think that um, might have some effect on, on the projects we start to see in the future. Yeah. Well, I think that you've talked a lot about the losers of sea level rise, but you haven't said anything about the winners and how we can get them to kick into the pot. I should, I should the hardware store. I mean, but, no, but <laughs> I mean, globally, for instance, there are certain you know, atolls in the Pacific that are gonna vanish entirely with a high sea level rise. Yeah. And clearly there's no doubt they're losers. But like the Soviet or Russia is not that concerned about you know, climate change because they lose a little bit of coastline to all of Siberia, suddenly becomes far more habitable. So you know, it's not as a, necessarily a bad effect on them. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking if we really got the you know, 10 foot sea level rise, that would wipe out the current Hampton Beach. But look at all the new shoreline property owners, you know, <laughs> half a mile back, but have now got a much more valuable asset. And in terms of compensation, I really think, you know, what we need to start doing is let's quit having people, you know, make major investments and then expect us to compensate them 10 years down the line. Like Jackson say, okay, the building that's there is no good. That's fine. We will buy it out as a big lot and not as whatever you're going to build on it. And the same sort of a thing with uh, you know, any of these properties, like, you know, poor Steve, he owns, you know, four homes in Hampton Beach. You know, that, that's a big investment. If he loses that, you can say he's economically vulnerable, but I don't really consider, you know, someone that owns four properties in Hampton Beach to be the sort of, you know, poor person that I need to worry a lot about. I mean, the same thing happens to someone who owns a ski condo in the ski area goes to what extent are we going to compensate uh, business owners for making poor business decisions so the losers get bought out by the government and the winners keep all their profits? So I think we need to find some way to get the winners, you know, chipping into this pool to help out the losers. I think that sounds like a, a good model that we'll have to figure out some way that, to get the political will to create. Um, <laughs> it, it definitely, one thing Hampton is grappling with, so this is kind of I'll just show this very quickly. Um, the way that it works now to get a buyout from FEMA, 
is that the town has to um, a, has to partner with the private property owner. The town has to apply to the state, and then the state can access the money from FEMA to give to the town, which then administers the money to the private property owner. That in itself is like such a burden for Hampton to figure out how to how to pick the right people to um, provide that service to, that it's just a very daunting issue that they're having trouble kind of figuring out a strategy for. Um, but within that and within the other strategies that get set up or systems that get set up, uh, making sure that the most vulnerable folks are compensated first um, is hopefully um, some sort of criteria that at least that I would like to see in the system. Um, but, but I'm not necessarily saying the most vulnerable. I mean, as an example, you know, Jack's is presently maybe a vacant lot. That may not be the most vulnerable lot in Hampton, but it's the one that can be acquired the most reasonably because it doesn't have a brand new set of condos. So I, opportunistically. I, I, I mean, I worked for the highway department one time, mm -hmm. and we got a call from a town that was this intersection that obviously needed to be widened at some point in the future. And one of the corner properties had just burned down. And they said, why don't you buy this property now when it's a bunch of charred wood instead of waiting until somebody builds on it and having to get down? And the answer is, well, gee, wouldn't that be a good idea? But you know, stuff like that has to go through the legislature. Mm -hmm. you know, we simply can't make that happen. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe a system to you know, be more opportunistic is part of the solution. Anyone have any thoughts on that? Comments? DOT owns more property in this state than you can shake a stick at because they buy up property that's unusable, some of it's contaminated. So DOT is really the biggest property owner in the state. And there's a whole, I don't know, it's not like there's dozens and dozens of people working as uh, oversight of these properties, but there's probably, I don't know, a handful of folks that uh, buy properties and I don't want to say maintain them because that would be exaggerating what they do with them because a lot of them are just brown fields or whatever that are not usable and um, they take them out of harm's way. So, so that, it's not that the state can't do it, uh, but um, I, I'm not certain what their criteria are, but we've had people in our CTM program who have worked with that group and they, they maintain that DOT is the largest property. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Okay, should we wrap up, Frank? Yeah, but there was one last question. Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering how far reaching the economic impact is on these events. Um, if you're living on a hill in Concord, <laughs> you may not think it's a big deal. Yeah. But long term, is it economic? Yes. Um, that is an analysis that I think needs to be done in a more comprehensive way. But um, one simple way to think about it is that the influence on rooms and meals tax um, <laughs> as, as Hampton's hotel rooms are less inhabited. Um, over time will influence uh, interior communities that get um, access to the, the revenue that Hampton makes off of rooms and meals tax. Um, the economic uh, benefit in, in our seacoast is, is pretty high compared to some other areas within the state. Um, for a variety of reasons, mostly tourism, but some business as well. And so I do think doing a more integrated assessment of um, how that would influence inland communities is, is worthwhile. Um, it does, it certainly is a challenge that we face when we are trying to make policy change at a state level in this particular state, which doesn't really identify in the same way that Rhode Island does or Maine does as a coastal state um, at its state house. So. Um, we'll see where that goes, but it's a good point. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have coffee.